There is a famous saying. It says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This was apparently uttered by a man called Samuel Johnson in the 18th century. There was another version previous to that, and it was, hell is paved with good intention, but that was a much earlier uh, maxim. Anyway, the reason why I'm saying this is because we see lately a lot of so-called religious scholars have tried to give excuses and reasons as to why we, the Muslims, do certain things, especially when it comes to haram and halal. This has been in the news quite a bit lately. I've been saying in my previous uh, recordings that this haram and halal is only Allah who can say. And yet today, it seems as though we have lots of haram and halal and the authority no longer rests with Allah. On the, on the contrary, it would appear that the authority to declare something as haram or halal lies with the Islamic Development Department. Now, this is a big problem because nowadays the Muslims, rather than refer to what Allah says, they are now more concerned with what Jakim says. So no matter what Allah says, if Jakim says it's haram, then it's haram. If they say it's halal, then it's halal. And this is ridiculous. One can say perhaps that maybe they have good intentions. And let's assume that they do have a good intention. Well, remember the maxim just now, the road to hell is paved with good intention. Why? Because you may be well intended, but because you are not prepared to accept the fact that you don't know, and rather than admit that, you want to propagate confusion and corruption of knowledge. No matter how well intended you are, you are misguiding people. And this is exactly what's happening. Now, I wonder if the Muslims in this country, especially the more affluent Muslims in this country, understand what's going to happen to you in your future. Now, all of us, when we were children, we were told, when it comes to religious knowledge, when it comes to knowledge of Islam, we had to learn several hadith, we had to learn the Qur'an, how to read it. We had to learn some of the laws, not many, some of them. And we had to make sure that we were good people, good human beings. We were not supposed to lie, we were not supposed to cheat, we were not supposed to steal, we were supposed to keep our word when we were given a trust, we were supposed to stick to it. Nowadays it's not like that. Nowadays our government representatives who claim that they are very good Muslims, who walk around in the garb of a so-called Islamic dress, in reality we can see that this is not the way Islam is supposed to be. For instance, do they consider their future? Now, what's going to happen to them in future? No matter what it is, one thing is certain. We are all going to die. That's our future. But what is in it for us? What does our future hold after that? Let's just talk about soon after. Now, soon after you die, now as far as the Muslim is concerned, death occurs when the soul leaves the body. So you're dead, your soul has left the body. Now for the Muslim, you are bathed, you are covered in, in the sheet, in the white cloth, you are made ready for burial. Now this soul that has, that has uh, left your body, it returns when you are going to be put into the grave. Now when we say it returns, let's, have, let's be very specific here. When it says that your soul leaves the body, that's death. But the physical body is dead. The soul, on the other hand, and this soul is the nafs al it's still alive. It still lives. And it returns to your body when you're about to be lowered into the grave. When you are all covered up, when you're all prepared to go to the graveyard, your soul returns 
to witness what's happening. And it sees, and it can hear, it experiences what's going on. It sees the people gathered around, it sees the people who are coming to pay their respects, it hears the conversation that it says to the body. Now you are taken to the grave and you are lowered into that hole in the ground. The soul also is lowered into the ground with your body and it experiences everything that you experience in terms of being able to hear and being able to see. It sees all this and it hears all what's happening. So it can see your loved ones crowded around the hole, putting dirt into your grave. It can hear your loved ones say the dua. It can hear the people who came to the graveyard to mourn for you and to pray for you. It can hear all those things. And as the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, when the people leave the grave, you can hear the footsteps leaving. Now you are all alone in that darkness, in that dark, dark hole cold ground and you're all alone and now the two angels will come and approach you and they will ask you who is your God who is your prophet what is your Deen this is what the angels will ask you and you have to be able to answer these questions correctly now my feeling is a lot of the time these modern Muslims these modern day Malayu Baru they will think to themselves, we don't have a problem with that because we are Muslim. We've already memorized the answers to these questions. So we have no problem with it. So when they ask, who is your God? We'll answer Allah. Who is your Prophet? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is your deen, Islam? They already know this. They know this by heart, by their tongue, by their brain. So they think to themselves, we got no problem. When we get lowered in the ground and the angels come and ask us, we'll very easily answer, not so fast. Now, the one that answers, this soul of yours that answers these questions by the two angels, it is not your tongue that is going to speak. It is not your brain that is going to speak. It's your heart, your spiritual heart that's going to answer these questions. How will the spiritual heart be able to understand and recognize these questions if it is pure? Now, if supposing you were to take money that was not yours, didn't belong to you, if you were to embezzle, if you were to receive bribes, if you were to be a corrupt person, all these things will, will put a black mark on that heart. If you continually do that, evil things, not just in terms of corruption, in terms of uh, uh, unjustly taking money that didn't belong to you, but also fitna, slander, envy, all these vices. If you do all of these, it will cover your heart with black spots, with black marks, until finally, if your heart is covered, your heart is not going to be able to answer those three questions because it cannot. It is unable to because it's covered. So don't think that if you take something that doesn't belong to you, like supposing you were to embezzle money or you were to be corrupt, and then you think to yourself, never mind, I'm going to legitimize the money by building a mosque. No amount of mosque building, no amount of tahfiz building, no amount of Islamic uh, donations is going to change that. Your heart is still going to be covered. No matter what you do to try to menghalalkan that money, is not going to work. It's not going to remove the blackness. And therefore, you will sit in the grave and you will not be able to answer those three questions. And if you can't, you are going to have a long time to suffer in the grave until Yawmuddin, until Akhirah, until the trumpet is sounded. You'll sit there and you will suffer. On the other hand, if you can answer those three questions correctly, then you will be in peace. You will have a peaceful sleep until the time when the angel blows the trumpet. Now think about that. Here we are talking about halal this and halal that. Whether water is halal or not, fruits have to be certified halal, baby diapers have to be certified halal. This is utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. This is a corruption of Islam. And why now, 
are the Muslims in such a situation that they find themselves in today? It's because Allah is angry with you. Now, how do we know this? One of the companions asked the Prophet before, the Prophet wasallam, how do we know when Allah is angry with us? And the Prophet replied, Allah shows his anger by removing those with knowledge from amongst you, and therefore you will remain ignorant. Look at today. Today we, we listen to the authorities of religion from the government. The government are not qualified to be talking about religion. The government is not qualified to be talking about what is haram and halal. Certainly not talking about whether diapers is haram and halal, whether fruit is haram or halal, whether to put Merry Christmas on a cake is haram and halal. It's ridiculous. If I were to ask a question, what if that cake shop made the cake using all ingredients which were legal, all ingredients which were, which, which were allowed for us to eat, and yet they made the cake into a shape of a pig? Now, would Jakim come and say this was haram? Because it had the picture of a pig? If that was the case, then you have to ask about the animal crackers, local made animal crackers that we used to have in this country, in a tin. They were little biscuits in the shape of animals. You had pig, you had dog, you had all kinds of things. Was that haram? Obviously not. This is just ridiculous. We have gone overboard, way overboard. And matters concerning religion are not the purview of the federal government. Matters concerning religion, as far as I understand it, are the purview of the sultans, of the agong. They are the ones who are supposed to manage and uh, look after religious concerns in their state. Why has this authority been transferred to a political body? Why? We don't know the answer to this. Only the politicians know this. Why do you want to corrupt the mind of the Muslims such that they can't even think for themselves? That is what is happening. They can't think for themselves without asking you to think for them. This is what we've been trying to say from our last videos, from our videos of before, from our interviews years ago. We say the same thing. Your mind has been controlled by ignorance and you don't know it because you yourself are trying to seek some kind of solution, some kind of answers, but you go and ask the wrong people. You go and ask the ignorant. A small matter becomes a big problem. Now we have made international news for supposedly consuming haram meat for 40 years. Now whose fault is that? A couple of years ago when there was a Cadbury scandal, apparently some people were saying that Cadbury was haram. And then the Malay NGOs, they started coming out in droves, going to sue Cadbury. Why? Was it their fault? They got the halal certification from Jakim. Misplaced anger. We understand that you are upset because you feel cheated that you are informed that something was halal when it wasn't. We understand all that. But don't think now that because you have consumed something which was suspect, that you now have to have a blood transfusion to clean yourself of the haramness. That's also ridiculous. But here we have so-called authorities sitting in positions of power reminding us of what is haram and halal when they themselves don't even know. Why, for instance, are they not talking about the vast wealth that certain people have that are now being questioned and on the other hand, they're using that wealth to build mosque, to build madrasa, to build surah, to build a religious school and think that that is actually cleansing them, cleansing the money. Remember, your destiny is the grave. How will you answer those three questions if your heart is covered? It is not your tongue that's going to answer that, remember that. It is not your brain, it's your heart. If your heart is covered, you are not going to answer that. Do you realize that? 
I sometimes believe that you don't think so, and therefore one questions the Iman of that person. That's how we can know. Today we are in such a terrible situation. Confusion reigns supreme. Our Prime Minister now, he has an opportunity to actually begin the reformation which was touted 20 years ago. He has the opportunity today. He should not squander this opportunity. Start the reformation. Begin now. It doesn't seem like you have the political will to do so. I may be wrong. But if you really want to prove your worth, if you really want to prove your legitimacy, begin the ref reforms which were spoken about 20 over years ago. I'm not sure whether, whether the government today is capable of such a thing, but we have to be optimistic. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. If that's the case, begin the reforms. You can start with Jakin. You can start by reforming that. After all, that is a department in the Prime Minister's office. It is a prime ministerial appointment that the minister sits in that position. Do you really need such a position? Because you're supposed to represent Malaysia as a prime minister, which means not just the Muslims. It's supposed to be the Muslims and the non-Muslims alike. That's who you represent. But if you have a division or a bahagyan or a, or a department or a jabatan in your government that is supposed to look out for Muslim welfare, but at the same time it it, uh, it confuses the Muslims and it also oppresses the non-Muslim, that is not Islamic. That is unjust. And as such, because we say that we are a Muslim country, we have to behave in like manner. Behave like proper Muslims. Don't be oppressive to the non-Muslims. Don't be oppressive to the Muslims themselves. Don't confuse them. Thank you.